Well, hey there, I'm Dr. Tom Ulrich, and I like to talk about leadership and engineering. Hey, in this video, what I'd like to talk about is uh, leading remote employees. Now, of course, during this COVID deal, you know, that's something that most managers find themselves in that situation, and particularly engineering managers, because especially with software engineers, you know, it's very easy to work from home. And so now a whole bunch of, of engineering managers are finding themselves faced with the challenges of leading people that they're not seeing day to day. And it's particularly complicated, like at, at Tandem right now, we're growing like crazy. And since the lockdown, you know, we've actually hired dozens and dozens of engineers and, and there's all these challenges related to, you know, if there were people you already knew, leading them remotely is hard. But now people, you've interviewed them remotely, you've hired them, and you don't really know them. And there's kind of all these these things that, that make a leading a virtual workplace uh, difficult. Now, the good news is, is... Uh, well over a decade, Microsoft identified this as something we're going to have to learn to, to deal with. And they've actually been pouring millions of dollars into research on how best to manage a virtual workforce. And so they've hired a number of researchers. The, uh, I think the lead one is a gal named uh, Karen Lojeski. She, If you go to Amazon, she's written all kinds of books and she's all kinds of journal articles and really a good researcher, respected respected researcher. And uh, what I'd like to do is use some of her work as kind of the basis for uh, this talk. Now, everything I, not everything I'm saying is coming from Lojewski. There's a few bits of my own that I'm going to put in here. But by and large, um, this is a book that if you're leading a team remotely, you know, using Teams and Internet and all that stuff, you, you really do need to, lead, to read this book. It's, I don't know, 15 or 20 bucks on Amazon, worth every penny. Anyway, so... Uh, what Lojewski does is she she uh, comes up with a handy concept which is called virtual distance. Now, you know that's uh, sort of similar to social distance, but but the idea of virtual distance is you you don't have all of the mechanisms that are usually uh, involved in getting to know people and communicating and things of that nature. And you know it it, it kind of goes like this. When you're all sitting in the room together, there's a lot of communication going on that you're not even aware of. You know, if something happens, uh, everybody sees it. And so, you know, there's there's an event that, that may shape things. Or, you know, if somebody tells a story, kind of everybody overhears it. I mean, with, with virtual distance, you don't have any of that. You have all these people in isolation. And uh, what Lojeski advocates then is she has what she calls a virtual distance leadership model. And she says there's there's three components to this model of, you know, and, and, and from her perspective, she's really writing not only from like, okay, we all used to work together and now we're dispersed. But, you know, she's writing in this, this idea that, you know, by say 2030 or something, uh, it will be the absolute norm for particularly for software engineers to be living in different states and and you know almost never see each other so she's she's thinking through not only how do you maintain a group that suddenly is remote but she's uh, uh, her model addresses you know how, the, kind of the whole thing like okay you've just hired six software engineers they don't know each other they've got to work together they've got to accomplish the objectives how, how do you even think about it and that's where her virtual distance leadership model comes in so the first part three parts first part is you know what what we have to do as uh, leaders is create context and you know there's a couple parts to that one is um, you know when you're all together and you're in meetings and uh, you know, all these things, it, it's a lot easier to communicate ideas like, okay, this is our mission, these are goals, we're going that direction. When you're not and people aren't overhearing things and, and you know, pretty much unless you say it to them, they ain't hearing it. Um, it's very, very important, according to Lajeski, to uh, underscore missions and goals. And, uh, you know, what I think she means by that is this idea of, okay, you may know what the mission is, you may know what the goal is, but as managers, we have to uh, 
merely make an effort to say it and say it and say it again. And, and I, I, a thing I've been saying for years is, you know, when it comes to leading people, even when you're face to face, but more so when you're remote, is, you know, if you haven't told somebody something at least three times, you probably haven't really told them it. So, um, you know, like if you're saying, hey, we need to kind of do this, you want to kind of go out of your way to say that multiple times. Uh, another thing that I've said for years is what you want to do when, when something happens, or particularly if there's, if you're making an announcement that's unsettling or something, I like to say things like, okay, let me narrate what's going on. Let, let, let's really call attention to this. So, you know, we were going this way, and what you just heard is like we're, have, we're pivoting. We're setting this work aside. Now we're going this direction, you know, because of a new crisis. We had to change marketing focus. But you see what I'm doing there is I'm going out of my way to say, to not only say what we need to do, but to sort of acknowledge if it's a change, to call, you know, this is a change. Or or if something doesn't make sense, you know, this might not make sense. You know, here's what it is. But really going over the top on communicating. Um, you know, another thing Lejewski says is important for creating context is for you to be constant, you know, as, as best possible and, you know, as engineers things change, but to, to, the ex to the best extent possible for you to be the one thing or to be one thing that simply is consistent, treat them consistently, um, you know, react to them consistently, say the same goals consistently, and yeah, if there's changes, then, you know, you got to do it, but, but the idea is to lean into the idea that you really try to be consistent. Now most engineers actually kind of do that by nature, but the challenge here is for engineering managers to really, you know, step up their game a little bit to be consistent. Um, the third thing is she calls it uh, create a comprehensive context and, and what the idea is, uh, you know, as a manager we'll go to some meeting and they'll make several corporate announcements and you'll kind of hear them and say, okay, yeah, no big deal. But you see the thing is if your team wasn't at that meeting, they didn't hear any of it. And what you realize more so in this remote context is, you know, all those little pieces of information, hey, we're launching a new policy, hey, our site in Boise is now doing this, just all these things that you heard because you were in a meeting, you have to get in the habit of realizing you have to pass all of that on. And so, you know, rather than watching passively as, you know, people make announcements, I mean, I would I would have a notebook or notepad or something and, and be keeping track of, you know, what are the things you need to tell your team about, realizing that you need to be the conduit that creates that, that context. Um, you know, and the other one she calls creating a contagious context. And um, she uses a, a really a, a, an expression I love. She says, you know, the leader needs to be the main storyteller. So because when, when you're at a company, you know, there's there's things that happen. There's goofy situations. There's, you know, stories get told over and over again. And, and, and if you're a new employee and you join the company and you're sitting there and other people, I mean, you overhear stuff. You know, someone says, oh, did you hear about that? Oh, it's crazy. Ten years ago, Ed did this, you know. And uh, remote employees don't get any of that advantage and, and what it does is it falls to the the leader to be the one who tells these stories and so you really want to lean into that and um, uh, you know be the storyteller now when we go over to followership theory uh, we've talked about that in some other videos um, you know there's really two things that make for a great Im employee one is that they're engaged like their hearts in it they're all in there yeah, I mean you know what engagement means intuitively and the other is that they think critically for themselves you know you don't want a robot you want somebody who's really thinking and the thing about this this context this creating context from Lojewski is you know when I read her work about it it occurs to me this is very very good from a followership theory because um, you know, you want people thinking for themselves, but but you want them to still kind of think like you would at tandem. And, and, you know, there's some context. And what she's doing is advocating that you give people enough context so when they think critically about things, it makes sense at tandem. Because it's one thing to have a, an idea how to do something. It's another thing to have an idea how to how to do something that would fit at, at tandem. I, I keep using the example of tandem because that's where I work. But I, but I mean, wherever you work, you know, there's there's lots of ways you can do things, but maybe only one way would work at your company. And the idea of creating context is as you give your people a chance to come up with ideas that work in the context. And, uh, you know, the other thing, when I listen to her talk about uh, storytelling, you know, in terms of engagement and just kind of being all, those stories are just wonderful 
uh, for creating engagement and, and, you know, particularly if your company's just got a lot of shenanigans and people did really funny things, you know, just kind of retelling the story, you know, in the software team years ago, we had this, this marshmallow fight where we, we brought in, I brought in, uh, like 50 of those 10 foot, uh, PVC pipes, like the, the half inch type you use for sprinklers and, and a bunch of fittings and stuff. And we all made marshmallow guns and then we had you know we, we the, the small little marshmallows you can put in a half inch pipe and you know and just and, uh, people laughed about that for for years and the facilities guys still mad about it because we got marshmallow all over the carpet i mean we had the fight in the parking lot but people stepped on it chaos but but that you know that's a that's an example of a story that that you know it captures so much of who, who tandem is when i tell that story of a marshmallow gun and in your organization's the same you know there can be stories or events that really communicate who you are much better than saying well we did a study and our cultural values are you know stories do way better Okay, so that's the first one. That's the big one, create context. The second one is to really work to cultivate community. And, um, you know, when you're sitting next to each other and lunchtime comes, you're like, hey, let's eat a little together. Or you, you go sit in the lunchroom, next, you know, sit next to somebody. There's all these ways that relationships naturally form. And, and on in a virtual and work environment, they don't. They typically don't. And what you got to do is go out of your way to not only create relationships between you and each employee, but, but be thinking about helping them create relationships with each other. One thing I'm a big fan of is, you know, when you're having your staff meeting or whatnot, um, I would not only do it, you know, sort of just, okay, here's the agenda items. But I, I think especially in COVID and all these things, give a chance to go around the room and uh, ask people, you know, how's it going? Just give them a chance to talk and just tell them, you know, and, and uh, you know, I re Kathy and I recently got a puppy and one time I just talked about her new puppy. And then, you know, not at all work related, but it was just, it was a chance to kind of, to re really to bond. And, uh, I, you know, with my last name, I, I'm very often toward the end of the alphabet. And what invariably happens is you set X amount of time and you're only halfway through and so, uh, you know, the last couple of people only get 30 seconds each or something. So the other thing I would say is when you, when you, uh, go around the room, I, I would mix up how, if you do it alphabetical, well then do it alphabetical one time, reverse alphabetical another, uh, you know, something like that. So you don't always give one person lots of time, but at any rate, um, I, and, and related to that, I would deliberately, have a little bit of laughing and joking and, and chatting at the beginning of each meeting. And, and particularly, you know, with, if you know that Bob, your new employee, just, um, you know, bought a new motorcycle, you know, say, Hey Bob, why don't you tell the group about your new motorcycle or so something like that. Um, and, uh, here's the big one. If, I think if there's any takeaway from this book, it's simply this. If you want to create community, your cameras need to be on in, every every video session so i would get uh rabid about that i mean i would just say hey guys we're putting the cameras on it's a whole different experience to see somebody than just to listen to them you get the facial expression and you know you, you learn something about me just by seeing my books back there and and about how messy my desk is here and and so on but but really we need to have those cameras on her research she's got a lot of research that shows you know, not only is that a good idea, but actually the bigger the screen, the better. And I think at one point she says, you know, in an ideal world, everybody would have, I forget the exact number. I think she said like 70 inch monitors, you know, but uh, the idea, and I think that's maybe a bit extreme and, and certainly maybe cost prohibitive. But, you know, the one thing everybody can do is just simply have your camera on for every single meeting. Um and, you know, that again, uh, this whole thing, this whole building relationships and having the cameras on and joking around, that just goes a long way toward uh, building uh, engagement among your, your people. Really, them having emotional bonds as opposed to just being, you know, robots to show up, do the work, and go on. And the final thing Lojeski says in her model is she says, uh, she advocates, uh, what she says is co-activating new leaders. Now, that's what she does. She likes to alliterate things in the letter C. And so, you know, create context, cultivate community, co-activate leaders. And then under each point, she's got things that start with C. So she's a little, little over the top with the C. So I think co-activating is a, a word I wouldn't use. 
Um, what she means is, if, if I understand what she's saying right, is to create space for new leaders to emerge because leaders typically emerge. You know, you have a bunch of people together and just people will kind of emerge. And, you know, you don't become a leader because someone gave you a title. You became a leader. Well, you just started leading is what it comes down to. And, uh, you know, you want to you wanna come at these, these online meetings and, and, by the way, daily meetings or scrums or whatnot. Very good idea. You, know, you can keep them short, but but certainly weekly as a minimum. You know, rather than have this mind frame of how am I going to keep these people on track, you know, you, you, the challenge is, uh, you know, I've, I've said several times, leaders create leaders. If you're not creating leaders, i got to wonder if you're really a leader. I mean, that's like a baseball player who can't throw a baseball. I mean, it's like, what? No, leaders create leaders. And uh, what you want to do then is realize, okay, it's virtual. I don't like put that on hold. Well, COVID's here. No, no more developing leaders. That's crazy. You use the COVID context to, you know, use it, figure out how to use that to help you uh, train leaders, help them to think like leaders. And I did another video recently where I talked about, you know, the van, one of the advantages of COVID is you'll see people naturally doing stuff and, and figuring out how to optimize relationships and whatnot. Those, those are probably the people that are worth investing, developing their leadership. At any rate, um, and, you know, in my, leader, in, in my leadership research, the, the one thing I've seen repeatedly is engineers generally want to influence the organization. Now, it's, it's not, all, not that all engineers want to be leaders or managers, rather. They want to exert influence. Some of them see the best way to exert the organization is by being a manager. Others think the best way to influence your organization is being by being a great individual contributor. By the way, and usually what it looks like to me is that really boils down to whether or not they had a good role model. You know, if, if they've had a manager that really helped them, they'll probably want to be a manager. And if they didn't have a manager, like if their manager was always a joke, kind of the Dilbert sort of manager, they probably won't be, especially if they had a bad manager but there was an individual contributor they respected, like a principal engineer they respected, what you'll find is those people really won't want to be managers. Um, but at any rate, one way or another, the idea is uh, allow people a room so they can start influencing the organization. Uh, one uh, term that uh, Lejeski uses that I really absolutely love is reverse mentoring, and the idea is you know, for the, you know, let's say a hire a new kid out of college, you know, that kind of the old school model is, well, kid, I'll teach you everything I know. Listen, they're coming out of knowledge, out of college, knowing stuff we don't know. So, for instance, I have this I, tandem. We recently formed this group that does scientific computing, and I'm leading that. And I hired, you know, everybody in the group was in college, you know, eight months ago or nine months, whatever it is. You know, recently they were all in college, and now we've got this whole team. And, uh, you know, it is true. I've got a lot more experience than they, and there's some things I know that they don't, and I am trying to teach them. But at the same time, I'm not a Python programmer. They all are. We're using Python for a lot of our work. And so I go out of my way to, to you know, hey, teach me about this. And that has a lot of really good things when you ask your people, particularly if they're much younger, you know, hey, teach me about this, show me what this is, talk me through this. Uh, at any rate, that's, that's what Lejewski's idea of, of reverse mentoring is. And at any rate, so, so that's Lejewski's virtual distance leadership model. You want to create context, you want to cultivate community, and you want to co-activate new leaders. One way or another, uh, what we want to do is lean into the fact that uh, leading uh, a virtual workforce is difficult. It takes more effort. But the truth is, COVID or not, that's where the country was headed with rising real estate costs. And, you know, nobody wants to live in the Silicon Valley because it's, you know, you fortune to, to buy a house. You can go to Montana and buy, you know, this big old ranch for a fraction of what a little two-bedroom condo would be. And those kind of economic pressures are actually, uh, you know, as, as Lojeski and others see it, you know, those are, those are kind of creating a future where, the norm right now, which we say is abnormal, like, hey, you'll get through this. Well, if the researchers are right, probably in about 10 years, this will actually be the norm where lots and lots of people are working from home. So, you know, if you're a manager, if you're a leader, uh, you need to lean into this. You need to learn how to uh, manage the, the virtual workforce. At any rate, I'm Dr. Tom Ulrich. Thanks for listening. If you want to see more videos, you can go to TomUlrichConsulting.com. 
on YouTube. You can search on Dr. Tom Ulrich or Engineering Leadership Guy. And hey, if you don't mind, would you give me a like, uh, maybe subscribe, that'd be better too. That, that really helps me out. But at any rate, uh, thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next time.